today I'm back working on the HP 9100B. So if you haven't seen the previous videos in this series, these are transistor-based calculators, quite complex devices, very interesting in terms of their electronics and a uh, very interesting memory system, or at least the, uh, the, the ROM system that they used. And um, I had two of these machines to repair. The first one uh, I repaired, found a few faults, and it's been on test and has been working flawlessly ever since. This one's been fighting me a bit. It was uh, superficially; it seemed to be working, uh, but when I left the self-test running, it would—I'd uh, come back an hour later and the self-test had failed, and the machine had locked up. So that's kind of fairly typical for this type of machine. It, they, they tend to develop peculiar faults so that uh, are possibly intermittent, and that's what this one had done. Now, in this case, it took quite a long time to resolve. I did start to video the process, but it got so convoluted and complicated and confusing, I decided that it would be easier just to explain what I found um, rather than try and show you uh, the bits of video that I took. Uh, it was mostly just me being confused, trying to figure out what was going on. Um, but what was happening was, if I did a calculation, say uh, added to 2.00 to 2.00, the answer should of course be 4. And most of the time it came out as 4, uh, but now and again I'd get what appeared to be a rounding error, so it might read something like 4.1. And it was very intermittent, it did it very uh, occasionally, and one thing to bear in mind with these machines, they do um, work on more digits than they display to avoid rounding errors. So it's possible it was something like that, um, but uh, what I ended up doing, you can, as you can see here, take these out as a complete assembly, put the boards in, power them up and although you can't see what's on the display you can hook up a logic analyzer and start doing some fairly in-depth testing on them and that's what I started doing. If you do hook up a logic analyzer to these machines be uh, aware that uh, they use uh, uh, minus voltages for their logic so it's um, is it basically 0 and minus 15, uh, 0 and minus 8 volts. Um, so you do need to make sure your logic analyzer is set up and can handle that, otherwise you'll either blow up the calculator or blow up your logic analyzer. But once it's set up, you can start looking into this sensibly. Also, for reasons I'll come to later, uh, you really need to have your logic analyzer set up in state mode and not sample mode or timing mode. Otherwise you will uh, possibly miss the problem. Uh, this turned out to be quite an interesting problem and uh, as I say it was coming up with uh, what appeared to be rounding errors so I started off by just pressing keys and trying to figure out exactly where or roughly where the problem might lie. Um, so what I originally thought was that maybe it wasn't properly completing the uh, processor instruction cycle. So I've shown this diagram before and whenever you run an instruction on this machine then you really are triggering these sequences of events. So each of these dots represents um, a particular action for a given uh, drive or instruction line. And what you can do is see if these are correct. So if you look into the uh, instruction cycle, basically for an ad cycle for example, uh, you can follow it through and the, the cycles are in flowcharts in the service manual and it will tell you what the steps are in the particular uh, instruction. If you then follow that through you can see which of the particular lines should be uh, activated and these are essentially latched so there is a series of flip-flops which are these circuits and um, the values, the bits are latched depending on whether they're needed or not and I kind of started by thinking maybe one of these wasn't latching properly so I started monitoring this but throughout the entire ad cycle I was getting all the right bits showing up the way that they should. In other words, the flip-flops that were involved in controlling the cycle were all showing the correct values. And all I'm doing here is looking at the output um, for a particular part of the cycle. Bear in mind there are two clocks or two major clocks on this and um, you need to make sure that you're looking at the right one. But what you can do if you want is look at the resultant clock here. You just need to bear in mind that you'll get overlapping what you're seeing on the logic analyzer. Uh, so once I'd mostly eliminated that, it was a case of where to look next. And 
It kind of started looking like the error was that the machine couldn't properly access uh, RAM and it wasn't able to latch the correct data from the ALU into the RAM. So I started looking into that and um, to, to eliminate whether the problem was reading data out or reading data in, you can do a very quick test. Um, I just repeatedly added two and two until the error showed up. In this case, it showed uh, 2.02, uh, sorry, 4.02 instead of four. I then subtracted 0.02 and I ended up with 4.000. So that was correct. In other words, it seemed to be able to load the uh, memory, but it was loading the wrong value. So that kind of brings you back to a, a more limited area and it seemed to be an issue within the ALU itself. It was giving out the wrong value, but that wrong value was being correctly stored in RAM. Um, so that uh, was kind of relief. It meant that the likely culprit was not the RAM. It could be, just, it may be that that particular bit or certain bits in the RAM weren't responding properly, but it didn't seem to be that. And so the, and the reason I say that is because you can change the address in RAM where certain uh, events are taking place and if I did that it made no difference. The fault seemed to be pretty much the same. It was intermittent so it's kind of hard to tell. Now ultimately what uh, I started doing was trying to single step through the, uh, the instructions but I never saw the problem when I did that. And that again started leading me to think that maybe this was a timing issue. Uh, and so what I did is I ended up disconnecting the main clock and uh, if we look at the schematic it's a fairly simple circuit, that's this circuit up here so I ended up disconnecting this at this point and injecting a signal, a, a clock from uh, my signal generator and it worked at anything up to 2 megahertz um, other things didn't work properly, such as the display, but um, they, they, I wasn't really using the display at that point anyway. I was just capturing this on the logic analyzer. And that's why I was using state mode, because it then didn't matter if it was a timing issue and you're using uh, sampling or timing, then you could miss the problem. But in state mode, uh, if you're looking at the correct clock, then you're really seeing what the machine is looking at. And it gives you a far better chance of catching something if it's timing related. Uh, so, as I said, if I went above about 2 MHz, then now and again the problem uh, would manifest itself. If I went up to about 3.8 MHz, then it wouldn't work at all. So, um, it's fairly critical in terms of its maximum speed, but then it would be anyway. And in fact, if you've read my book on the transistor microprocessor, uh, in that I discuss the difficulties in designing discrete machines like this because of the timing requirements throughout the individual circuits. And that's what this started looking like. Uh, so what I ended up doing was looking at the uh, flip-flops that are in the ALU and in the latches that are connected to the ALU. And uh, sure enough, what I found was one of them wasn't latching quickly enough. It was latching, so when I was single-stepping, it was working. Uh, but the output was quite slow to change. And I say quite slow to change, it was changing relatively quickly, but it was taking about six microseconds to change. And um, that was way too slow for it to operate correctly, and um, it was now again seeing the wrong value on its output. So um, the next question is what to do about it. Now, these flip-flops are formed using some hybrid modules. So each of these circuits, the transistors are these external transistors, but a lot of the components, um, the ones essentially that are numbered. So if we look at the schematic, you'll see that uh, the, uh, some of the components have numbers next to them in little squares. And that is the component number of the component within a given uh, hybrid module. And obviously these are unobtainable. I did toy with the idea of making some of these uh, available and um, with the experience I had with the protection modules for the uh, 9010 I decided not to bother and um, I looked around the rest of the machine and if you look at the instruction cycle some of the flip-flops are uh, triggered at the beginning of the cycle but the outputs aren't looked at until the end of the cycle whereas others 
and these are the ones that were causing problems. The output is looked at almost immediately after they're triggered, and that was one of the ones that was causing a problem. So all I ended up doing was swapping two of the hybrid modules, one from a, uh, a low timing critical part of the circuit uh, with the one that was causing the problem. And then the problem completely went away and I haven't been able to reproduce it since. Even up at about 3.7 megahertz, the circuit works fine. So it was um, the far easier fix than having to try and find a way to uh, reproduce the hybrid module. It's just making sure that you pick um, a, a kind of donor flip-flop that uh, is in a non-critical part of the circuit. Once I've done that, as I say, it worked fine. I found various other faults. I had a lot of dry joints on the bottom of this assembly as I did with the previous machine. Uh, I went through, cleaned up all the contacts and this now seems to be behaving itself. So the next step is to start to reassemble this machine. So as I say, it's taken quite a while to get to this point, which is why I haven't posted a video on these uh, for a while. But now I think I've got this sorted out. It's been running for pretty much a week without showing a problem. So the next thing is to start getting this reassembled. So I had the usual series of repairs to make. I needed to repair the mounting bracket, clean up all the contacts, make sure there were no dry joints, clean up the keyboard, clean up the case, uh, deal with a few little dings and scratches on the case, that's now done. So one of the next jobs is to clean up the front bezel. Now I have been asked previously how I go about cleaning these and this is a good example. It is very badly um, scuffed up. I don't know how well this is coming across on the camera. If I hold it at the right angle hopefully you can see what appears to be dirt but it's not dirt. It's it looks like it's where it's, someone's attempted to clean it and it's kind of scuffed up and um, scratched and uh, you can uh, barely see through it. It looks really messy and the other side is even worse. Uh, so what I'm going to do is very carefully remove the plastic from the uh, metal uh, frame. I advise you don't do this unless you really need to. Uh, it's very easy to snap these plastic tabs off. What you have to do is very carefully bend each of the little metal tabs up. Don't just try and lever them off otherwise it will guarantee you break the uh, plastic tab off. There's only four of them and once I've removed those then I can uh, separate the plastic from the metal and it will make it much easier to clean. So I'll do that first and then we'll have a look and uh, see how I go about cleaning something like this. I've got the last of the spring clips off and uh, the way I go about getting these out is to take a plastic tool of some sort, preferably one that's got kind of step levels or just 3D print something. And what you can then do is very carefully uh, use something that's quite soft. So these uh, tweezers will bend very easily uh, so I'll know if I'm putting too much force on them. And all you do is you kind of walk the, um, the clip up. So you put the tip of the um, tweezers uh, underneath and then use the plastic tool as kind of a lever and very carefully lever up. You, you're not trying to lever up the outside of the clip, you're just trying to lever up the little tab. What will happen is it will kind of release from the plastic and lift slightly and you just keep working your way around, just go around and um, uh, as it, the, the plastic clip comes up the post you can just go to uh, thicker um, pieces of plastic to lever off you're not putting much force on this, it's just literally to move the tab up very slightly and then ultimately it will lift off and in theory you should be able to do that without breaking anything, you just got to take your time and um, be patient, it can take a while to get these off. Uh, once you've got them all off you can just lift the metal bezel off and then we've got proper access to the plastic underneath and we can now give this a really good clean. It uh, also gives us access to the underside of the error uh, light, so we can now clean this as well. You can see this is all murky and grey as well, so we can clean that. And of course we can give the uh, metal cover a good clean as well. Uh, so this is uh, how I go about doing that part of it. Now, with regards to the front, we've got this textured area here and the, uh, the bit we want to actually polish. I don't want to polish the textured part. I only want to polish the uh, what should be the shiny window. So what I'm going to do there is just put some masking tape around uh, the outside of the window so when I polish it it will just be the window itself. 
and then I will use Nervous number 2 and give this a really good polish. It will take a while, there's some fairly deep scratches. This piece of plastic is coloured all the way through, so I don't need to be worried about taking the surface off, it's not going to discolour it. But having said that, I don't want to work too much in one area. If there's a deep scratch, I need to polish the entire area uh, the same, otherwise you could end up, because it's, it's kind of tinted, and if you get a thin part, you'll end up with a kind of a pale area. So uh, I'm going to polish the entire area. Most of the issues on this one are actually on the inside, so I'll try to get this again on the at the right angle, hopefully you can see these kind of cloudy, as I say it's not dirt, it, this, this won't rub off, uh, it's actually um, scuffing, I think someone's uh, made an attempt to clean this and um, it hasn't gone well, so I'll try and get this uh, cleaned up and then uh, we'll look at the results once it's done. So I'm pretty much done in polishing this, I don't know how well this will come across but it now looks extremely nice. I've got rid of all the deep scratches and um, on the inside as well it's looking a whole lot better. So the this makes a big difference when you're working on a piece of uh, equipment like this to get a very nice uh, clear finish and it makes the entire machine look so much better. It looks uh, almost like a new machine and this has come up um, extremely nicely. Okay, I've uh, also polished up the, or half of the um, Everlight housing. I've done half of it because it can be quite difficult on the camera uh, to see the, the before and after effects. So I've polished just the bottom half and I'm hoping this comes across on the camera. Um, you get this kind of build up of uh, nicotine and yellowing of the plastic and for the most part you can polish it out and it does again look a whole lot better. Now this is on the inside of the machine so it may never be seen um, but um, I'm restoring this so uh, that's what I'm going to do. I've also polished up the other side and this was uh, just built up with layer after layer of dirt and grime and uh, when I clean this off I got a whole load of dirt. This is not the paint, this is um, just dirt that builds up behind here. Um, and again it should look a whole lot better and the illumination should be better as well. Uh, so what I can now start doing is I'll get the tape taken off I'm going to go over this one more time um, just to try and make it look as nice as possible and then I'll get the uh, entire assembly uh, put back together. I might replace this rubber on here, I don't think it's original, I'm pretty sure they didn't use this and this is way too hard and a bit concerned this is going to allow the tube to get damaged. Uh, it may be original, maybe they switched um, the type of uh, rubber they were using but I'm surprised they went with something quite as hard as this. It, um, isn't giving much protection to the tube so I'll give that some thought. So what I can do now is get the machine reassembled so in the next video I'll start getting the machine put back together and um, hopefully we'll be able to see whether or not I have actually dealt with the underlying problem that it had of it uh, giving uh, odd uh, results on occasion. Uh, either way it should look a lot better, uh, maybe some extra work to do once it's reassembled uh, but we'll see um, how well it works once we get it put back together. So that's how it looks once it's been reassembled and um, has come up extremely nicely. It looks a whole lot better than it did so that's now ready to go back into the machine. So I'll get the machine reassembled and in the next video we'll start trying to bring it back to life.